Eleven more COVID patients die, and children aged between six months and three years old can get the Sinovac jab starting Thursday. And Joe Biden announces the killing of the Al Qaeda chief in a U.S. drone strike in Afghanistan. Hong Kong locked 4,123 new COVID cases today, including 3,889 local infections. Another 11 COVID patients have died, including a 22-month-old infant girl who passed away yesterday at the Eastern Hospital. The remaining deceased patients, four males and six females, were between 65 and 96 years old. One of them, a 65-year-old man, suffered from terminal lung cancer, which the authorities believe is a related cause of death. Most of the deceased were unvaccinated. Meanwhile, four more elderly care homes reported new infections. Some residents and staff members have to be quarantined. Fourteen schools also saw new cases of infection, including four people who were linked to a school bus. Starting this Thursday, children aged between six months and three years old can get the Sinovac jab. Meanwhile, authorities said negotiations to procure a BioNTech vaccine designed for infants are underway, with the lowest vaccination age in Hong Kong remaining at five years old. Timothy Lee has details. From 9 a.m. Thursday, parents can bring their children aged between six months and three years old to community vaccination centers, general outpatient clinics or private clinics for the Sinovac jab. The children can get three jabs in total and will have the same waiting period between each dose as the city's teenagers. As for the BioNTech vaccine, experts believe that it will be safe for use in infants as young as six months old. However, the government said it must first negotiate with the pharmaceutical company to procure a special infant version of the jab. Overseas statistics have shown that three doses of the BioNTech jab can reduce rates of COVID infection with light symptoms among infants aged 6 to 23 months by 75.5%. While those between 2 to 5 years old will see an efficacy rate of 82%. In South Africa, research found infants aged between 6 to 23 months old produce a sufficient amount of antibodies after two doses of the Sinovac jab. However, the chairman of the CHP Scientific Committee on Emerging and Zoonotic Diseases, Professor David Hui, said he is still concerned about the chances of infants contracting myocarditis from the jab. Meanwhile, Chairman of the Scientific Committee on Vaccine Preventable Diseases, Professor Lao Yu Long, remarked that the city can attempt to dilute the currently available BioNTech vaccine for use on infants. But William Chui, who serves as the president of the Society of Hospital Pharmacists of Hong Kong, warned about the risk of extracting dosages. He believes it is extremely difficult to extract precise amounts for an infant vaccine, adding that any miscalculations could affect the infant's immune response. Timothy Lee, TV News. In Macau, all governmental departments and commercial premises resumed operations today after weeks of a semi-lockdown. That as well as the resumption of dining services at eateries until Sunday for now. Many people rushed to restaurants this morning saying they had not dined out for a long time. Beauty parlors also reopened, with some salons saying they're already fully booked for the next few days. For people entering a venue where wearing a face mask throughout the visit is impossible, or when the visitors are going to stay there for a long period of time, they need to show proof of a negative nucleic acid test result obtained within the past three days. Certain target groups, including food delivery workers as well as bus and taxi drivers, must continue getting tested every day. Still to come on tonight's news, the first ship carrying Ukrainian grain to world markets in months is expected to be in Istanbul tonight. Car distributors agree not to require car owners to go to designated repair centers. And sources say public housing tenants could face a 1.17% rent increase.
Welcome back. The United States has used nuclear non-proliferation talks to accuse Russia of using Ukraine's largest nuclear power station as a nuclear shield by stationing troops there. This as the first grain ship to make its way out of a Ukrainian port heads towards Turkey, so far unimpeded. Matthew Bray reports. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said Russia had troops based at the Zaporozhye nuclear plant and as such Ukraine was at a disadvantage. Russia is now using the plant as a military base to fire at Ukrainians, knowing that they can't and won't shoot back because they might accidentally strike a nuclear uh, a reactor or highly uh, radioactive waste in storage. They the Ukrainian deputy foreign affairs minister said action was needed to prevent a nuclear incident, although the plant has been largely quiet since Russia started firing on it back in March. The first grain boat that left Odessa Monday is making its way to Tripoli and Lebanon. The Rizzoni is expected to dock in Istanbul early Wednesday, where teams of Russian, Turkish, Ukrainian and UN officials are supposed to inspect it. The Istanbul Control Center was established in July. It monitors the movement of ships carrying grain via satellite and other means. Turkey expects roughly one grain ship to leave Ukrainian ports each day as long as the agreement doesn't crack. But millions of tons of grain remain in Black Sea ports. There is still work to be done on clearing mines and creating a framework for ships to enter the conflict zone safely. On the war fronts, the Ukraine presidential office said three civilians were killed and 16 wounded in the Donetsk region over the past 24 hours. And there was more shelling in Mykolaiv overnight. A university dormitory and apartments were hit. No casualties were reported, though. Matthew Bray, TVB News. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres is warning that the world is just one step away from nuclear annihilation. Speaking at a conference to review the 50-year-old Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, Guterres said the nuclear threat was at its highest since the Cold War. The pandemic delayed conference is aimed at preventing the spread of nuclear weapons. In a conciliatory letter to the conference, Russian leader Vladimir Putin wrote that there can be no winners in a nuclear war and it should never be unleashed. The UN chief, however, had no qualms about laying out the dangers as he saw it. But luck is not a strategy, nor is it a shield from geopolitical tensions boiling over into nuclear conflict. Today, humanity is just one misunderstanding, one miscalculation away from nuclear annihilation. We need the treaty of non-proliferation of nuclear weapons as much as ever. British Foreign Secretary Liz Truss has received a major boost for her campaign to become the Tory leader and hence the next Prime Minister. She has got the backing of Penny Mordaunt, the candidate she narrowly defeated, to make the last two. Mordaunt joins other senior ministers who have backed Truss in recent days, including Defence Minister Ben Wallace and Chancellor of the Exchequer Nadim Zahawi. Mordan, speaking at a Hustings event, said she would back trust on account of her resolve and her sense of duty. Polls of Conservative members put trust ahead of Rishi Sunak in the contest to succeed Boris Johnson. 180,000 party members will vote for the new leader. The result will be known on September 5th. Back locally, the Competition Commission has launched a consultation exercise after seven car distributors agreed not to require car owners to go to designated repair centres for vehicle maintenance or repair services during their warranty period. Under the new plan, car owners will have freedom to choose where to get the services without risking their warranties being revoked. Christy Khan has more. In Hong Kong, owners of passenger vehicles are bound by warranty terms that maintenance and repair services have to be carried out at authorized repair centers within the warranty period. If not, they may risk losing the warranties. But seven car distributors, including Da Chong Hong Holdings and Lam Long Motor Group, have committed that they will no longer impose such restrictions on the car owners. They will not enforce the existing warranty restrictions or include them in new warranties. Also, they will amend the contracts within 19 days after the new commitments come into force. Their proposed commitments over a total of 17 car brands, including BMW, Ford, Honda and Toyota. 
This means car owners will be able to choose whether they would like to use the services at the official repair centers or seek services outside. The commitments will last for five years from the effective date. The Competition Commission said they have started a consultation on this proposal. Transport sector lawmaker Frankie Yik welcomed the proposed commitments by the seven car distributors. He said the authorized repair centers may lower their charges under this arrangement. And he suggested that vehicle owners have to include all the details about their maintenance or repair services in the invoice. He believes this will help avoid unnecessary arguments in the future if the passenger car is sent back to authorized repair centers again. Christy Khan, TVB News. The Legislative Council will discuss next Monday the issue of public housing rent review. Sources familiar with the matter said there would be a 1.17 per cent rent increase. Under the current mechanism, public housing rents are adjusted every two years. Sources said the coming rent hike would be between 5 and $66 per household, but the increase could be waived during the first year of the adjusted rent. The Housing Authority last adjusted public housing rent levels in 2020 with a rise of 9.66% and a two-month rent waiver for tenants. The High Court has ruled in favour of Chao Hang Tong over the lifting of reporting restrictions for committal proceedings in a national security case. Chao is a former vice chairperson of the Hong Kong Alliance in support of patriotic democratic movements of China. She sought to challenge Principal Magistrate Peter Law's decision not to lift the reporting ban on pre-trial proceedings of the court case. Law earlier said that removing the restriction might lead to a serious undermining of a fair trial. High Court Judge Alex Lee, a national security law designated judge, made the latest ruling. He said Peter Law's reasoning was against the principles of open justice that govern the exercise of judicial power in the context of restricting access to or reporting of court proceedings. Lee ordered the magistrate to lift the reporting restriction at the next court hearing. And that's the news. Thanks for joining us.